With a look at all this, we're joined now by royal expert Rafael Havel Menku. He is with Burke's Peerage and Gentry. What do you make of this this debate? Is this kind of a slag against Charles? Not at all. In fact, uh, I think people have actually um, grown more comfortable with the Prince of Wales over the last few years. Uh, essentially, there's been a 15-year period in the wilderness for the Prince of Wales. Um, ever since, obviously, the, the dark days of, of uh, Diana. And uh, people have tried to come to terms with his new life with the Duchess of Cornwall. And uh, I think they've actually got a soft spot for him now. Because in many ways, all of the um, crackpot tendencies which people used to uh, make fun of him in the 80s, talking to plants and so forth, he's actually now seen as a bit of a Renaissance man. Uh, organic farming, he pioneered the uh, talk about that, and sustainable living, the environment education, art and architecture, multi-faith societies. I mean, these are all hot uh, phrases of today, and he was a pioneering spirit there. Uh, and I think very much people are regarding him more as a national treasure than they ever did before. Uh, do you think perhaps his relationship with his sons has had something to do with this too? Very much so. I mean, Prince of Wales was always a loving father. However, he wasn't the most... Um, adept in the, with the PR machine at the outset, uh, unlike Diana, who was always, always came across as being a very caring mother. Prince of Wales was just as caring, he just didn't display it as much in public. But in recent years, that love and affection has really come through, and it's also been clearly reciprocated by the two boys, and I think that's had a large role to play. More so in Britain than in Canada. The Prince of Wales doesn't have as strong a relationship with the Canadian people as he does in Britain. Um, and I think in Canada, it will take a, a bit more effort to actually convince Canadians. Uh, and the, the, the fault is not just with the media uh, constantly dredging up the stories from the past, but also I think it also involves the monarchy making more of an effort to get the Prince of Wales to visit Canada more often and mm. more frequently. They will be his future subjects after all. And I think uh, the impetus is on the, the, the palace and Clarence House to actually reach out to Canadians more. Is there, is there a growing movement, though, among people that, that they would like to see the rules of succession changed? Yes, very much so. Seventy percent of people in Britain want the um, uh, succession changed so that um, uh, a baby girl, if she is born before a baby boy, will become a queen, and also that Catholics should be permitted to marry the heir to the throne. I mean, it's uh, completely indefensible in the modern era, I think, to have a discriminatory legislation uh, preventing uh, women and Catholics from succeeding to the throne. Uh, and we're living in the age when the monarchy has embraced uh, Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, and yet they're still constrained by uh, a bigoted piece of legislation, which was not their doing. It was forced on them by Parliament. The monarchy itself was never discriminatory. These were shackles placed upon the crown by uh, a Protestant Parliament. But I think certainly the mood is for that to change. But that's quite a, a complicated constitutional quandary because it will require the consent of Canada, of Australia, New Zealand, Jamaica. There are 16 realms, all of whom share the same sovereign. So to change the act of settlement uh, for the throne would require all of their consent. Otherwise, you might have the uh, nightmare scenario where somebody succeeds to the throne in Britain, <laughs> uh, but not in Canada. So you could mm -hmm. have one different king for Britain and Canada if they didn't change their laws uh, multilaterally. Uh, did you so say, did you say sir, it would have to be unanimous? Indeed it would. The Statute huh. of Westminster of 1931 states that to change the succession to the throne will require the consent of all 16 of the countries. There were more than 16 uh, at the time today. Uh, and so um, Stephen Harper would have to be consulted, the Canadian government and the Australians, and they would need to act together unanimously on this issue. You can't have one country uh, decide to have a different royal succession to the others. They're all bound together. In well, fact, there have been discussions taking place privately at the, between 10 Downing Street and 24 Sussex Drive and uh, with Australia and New Zealand and Jamaica. These discussions have been ongoing quietly behind the scenes to try to work out a resolution to what is really an indefensible situation. And in 2002, Tony O'Donoghue, an Ontario Member of Parliament, try to challenge this in the Supreme Court, and certainly I can see a challenge coming up on the grounds of the European Human Rights Convention, too. It just seems to me that if you were to uh, t take a casual poll of, of the countries involved, it would be a slam dunk that it would pass. Am I Very wrong? So, but I think, <laughs> I, think it's a, well, I think it's a hornet's nest, though, because I think once you start to discuss 
who should succeed and how the succession to take place, you may have some uncomfortable discussions in certain countries. I'm thinking of Australia and Jamaica particularly, saying, well, if we're going to visit this at all, why don't we just do away with the institution altogether? So it's a question of timing, and it's a question also of what the outcome will be. Oh. Well, sir, it's always good to talk to you. We thank you very much for your time today.